to say thank you also to all the organizers, uh, to Magda and Vernie and Ted and everyone who's put this together the last few years. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource. That's why I'm giving an introduction. <laughs> a wonderful resource and a wonderful opportunity to be here. Today I want to take the workshop model and focus, although you have in the booklet a, uh, a couple texts and several uh, textiles, several ritual objects from Prague. I want to look at this one as our main focus and, and bring the texts and the other objects to sort of help put it in context. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Um, this is a Zax Parocha given by Natan, son of Issachar, called Karpel Zax, and Hadassi, daughter of Moshe, in the year uh, 5362, 160102, in Prague, probably given to the Alt Neuschel. Presumably, Had presumably Hadassi was Natan's wife. And I want to use this object, which as I said, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute, as a prism to look at the intersection of a few different phenomena that are characteristic of Prague in this period and of other places and times, one being material culture, particularly material culture in the sacred space, obviously represented by the uh, curtain for the, for the Ark of the Torah Scrolls, known as a parochet. Another phenomena being liturgy, particularly local liturgy, the use of sacred time, and the third component being memory, how those two items, how ritual, uh, ritual objects, material culture, together with local liturgy are used, the intersection of those two phenomena are used by families and by the community in Prague to preserve their own local memories. And I came to ritual objects, uh, I started looking at the objects in Prague as part of an investigation of this community's memory, of the memory of early modern Jews, which for Prague for this period for various reasons I define as approximately 1580 to 1730. Uh, the way the Jews of that community looked at, remembered, recorded, recalled, tried to perpetuate events and individuals that, that were part of their own community for their own community's future. In other words, as opposed to, not as opposed to, but in addition to being part of the overall spectrum of Jewish life from the beginning, from the rabbis to the messianic age and so forth, how this community does or doesn't, and, and in what ways, by posing the question I answered, that the fact that I thought that it does, uh, take an interest in its own particular history and the history of its families. Now when I assumed that I would look at ritual objects as part of this uh, investigation, it didn't take me very long to realize that the obvious association of memory with ritual objects in even posing that uh, those two things, putting those two things together, I was really bringing a contemporary assumption based on contemporary Jewish practice in the United States and, and other places that we give, that somebody gives a parochet, a Torah curtain, or a Torah mantle, or some other object to a synagogue in memory of a deceased loved one, very often, most often, uh, an ancestor, somebody who's older in the course of the ordinary life cycle, that this is a way we express memory in this space. Uh, when I began to look at the objects, I saw that in the 17th century, at least in the 16th and early 17th century, it didn't work exactly that way. Uh, it worked in a different way. There still is an association with memory, but we need to throw out some of those modern assumptions about how it worked. Uh, I want to, before I come to discuss this parochet, first of all, make a little bit of a uh, disclaimer that I am coming from this historical, social, and cultural historical point of view. Uh, Vivian Mann is one of the pioneers in the field of investigating these particular objects from Prague. Uh, another woman named Bracha Yaniv, who is a scholar in Israel, has done extensive research on the, on the Prague Parochot. And I am not an art historian. I will say a little bit about the iconography, but I'd be welcome uh, any comments that people have about how that relates to my overall historical claims. That's really uh, I find myself, despite best intentions, being drawn, of course, to the text and to the texts that surround these things. Before I talk about the parochet, I also want to put us a little bit in the context of material culture in early modern Prague. When we talk about 1602, we are at the height, or maybe the beginning of the decline, of the period of Rudolf II, an emperor, a uh, Holy Roman Emperor, who brought his capital from Vienna to Prague in this period, who brought artists from Italy, from the Low Countries, many uh, artists of origins in the Low Countries who had then trained in Italy and came to Prague, an amazing community of artists and scholars who worked in the castle and who worked throughout Prague in this period. Uh, in terms of comments that we had yesterday about the interaction between royalty, we're not talking about just the noble, we're talking about Rudolf, we're talking about the Holy Roman Emperor, what happens in his castle and the relationship, whether there's just a trickle down or, or some of the relationship that goes on in bringing the sort of themes from those artists into the city. There's extensive 
exhibitions and works that have come out in the last several years. In addition to the exhibitions and catalogs from Prague, there's a scholar named James Palmitessa who's written about a particular neighborhood in Prague in this period and gone house by house in the new town where Jews did not live uh, to see how themes of royalty and nobles in Prague were brought, adapted, changed, used differently in different kinds of households. And the Jewish community in its own way is certainly part of that process in Rudolfine Prague. Uh, something else to be aware, in the synagogues of early modern Prague, if you visited them, especially the Altneuschel, which is the oldest and most famous, you may be accustomed to dark and dreary spaces, which is how I was impressed the first time I was there, inspiring perhaps for history and an aura of spirituality, but not particularly noted for colorful, vibrant, aesthetically pleasing interiors. But as this prochet and the other objects uh, testify, that was not the case among 17th century worshipers in the Altneuschel and in Prague's other large synagogues. Uh, colorful textiles, textiles filled the space. The walls of the Altneuschel until 1618 were actually painted in polychrome. They were whitewashed in 1618. Uh, there were silver and gold objects, both as decorations and as accoutrements for the Torah scrolls. Visitors, and I, the quotes that I have are from much later, but Avram Alevi, who wrote a travelogue in Yiddish published in Amsterdam in 1764, did this typical European grand tour as a Jew, though, uh, of Europe. When he writes about Prague, writes about both the music in the synagogues, uh, the cantors, the organ, and also uh, the ritual objects that he sees, he writes, and uh, there's one key word in the Yiddish that's not entirely clear, but he writes, one sees in these shuls beautiful decorations of marble and also engraved woodwork, the most beautiful, apparently bordered work that one has seen in all his days, specifically parochets, Torah curtains, and also an object with bordered needlework that is called kaporet, which was a valence that was placed on, uh, uh, over the very top part. So there was another object in Prague that was placed sometimes uh, along the top, as sort of a, an additional textile on top. He writes, here one uh, stitches pearls and other precious stones into the clothes for the Torah scroll, which makes a beautiful decoration. So this is a community that is known uh, in Europe for these beautiful objects. It is in this period between, uh, in 1564, when the Hebra Kedisha was reorganized, this was a small community reorganizing after two expulsions in the 16th century, or near expulsions, not clear exactly what happened. By, 17, by 1600, there's probably about 3,000 Jews in Prague, and by 1700, even following two devastating events in the 1680s, about 10,000 Jews in Prague. So you're talking about the largest, certainly the largest Jewish community in terms of population in a single place in Northern Europe. Uh, there may be more in, in the Ottoman Empire in a single place, but this is an enormous community with, with uh, enormous disparity of rich and poor and among the rich, enormous resources. In terms of the parochot that we have from Prague, this is one of the three oldest extant parochot that we have from Prague, uh, one from 1593 and another one from the 1590s. As I said, Brachy and Niv has written about it, um, and there have been more mo recent studies about the, uh, the functions. First of all, the, the iconography a little bit, or not iconography, but the, ma the, the makeup of it, it's very typical of the, of the parochot from Prague to be based by this period, and Yaniv constructs what maybe they would have looked like earlier in a period that we don't have, but the silk um, being based on a silk textile. Textiles become extremely important, become the, the centerpiece. And this really relates to some of the things that Professor Finland said yesterday about the importance of silk, the reuse of silk. Uh, they're clearly from different kinds of lists. We're very many textile dealers in Prague, and this was a known, understood commodity. This is not that one person brought, went to Italy and bought an expensive silk and nobody else in the community understood it. It would have been very well understood. Uh, some people have claimed that it may have been out of fashion silks, but since we've seen that there's the secondary market, which probably is not quite as well understood for Bohemia as it is for Italy, but we can begin to imagine from the ideas that she that she raised some of the some of the interactions that might have gone into the acquisition. This one obviously was refurbished after 1602. There is almost no chance that it was originally two different pieces, um, but somebody replaced that later on. The two column motif, Brachy and Eve also talks about this was originally, according to her, a single gateway, like the gateways in the title pages of Hebrew books. Sha'ar, right, it's literally a gate. Uh, the crowns that have been displaced because it's now two separate columns are, and, and she sent me other pictures, are reminiscent of the Rudolphine crowns. And most importantly, for our context, the inscription that now goes on the top. And as we have in the cemetery of Prague, this is, it's hard to see in this picture, but these are three carps that are laid one over the other. The donor is again known as Carpal Zax, and this is, becomes his personal symbol. 
Hmm. So he's representing himself in donating, uh, in donating this object to the synagogue. He's really representing himself in that space. Um, now we've, we, some of the social functions of donation are pretty well, uh, have, have been in, in recent years pretty well explicated, both Vivian Mann and Richard Cohen together and separately in articles about the court Jews and about other articles about ceremonial objects, about the significance in terms of proving a family status of giving an important object. And also what's interesting in terms of their work on the court Jews, the idea of bringing in an aesthetic sensibility that a, a rich, wealthy Jew goes out in the world and sees things and wants that to be part of his own world. So not only my own status, but some sort of sensibility about where I want my home, how my home in terms of the synagogue, the communal home should look. Uh, in terms of Prague, specifically Alexander Putik, who is a scholar in Prague, has published an article where he did a complete breakdown economically for a slightly later period. He starts in 1648. He's able to use tax records from Prague to prove what we all could have guessed, that the donations are overwhelmingly from the highest economic strata. Um, he and Yaniv both work on the Torah curtains on the parochet, which is the largest, most expensive item to give. What I would love to see is a more extensive study of the Torah mantles, which are considered in some ways holier because they are closer to the actual Torah scroll, but is a little bit less expensive and easier for more families to give. We see many, I've seen in going through what's been published, many by rabbis, donated by rabbis and their families who maybe couldn't, maybe, I'm presuming, guessing, uh, hypothesizing, couldn't donate a Torah curtain. Um, so, so the economic function is certainly there. The one thing Putik has noticed in the late 17th century that for those who stretched economically to give a Torah curtain, there's often a political function within the community. It is still prestigious in the late 17th century to be part of the communal leadership in Prague, and some of the families that were most active politically were also most active in giving these objects. So he adds, in addition to the economic um, a political function, similar work's been done in Amsterdam, for instance. We already had the name today of, of Julia. Martha Cohen, who's done similar work in Amsterdam, you can get a very clear picture. What I would like to ask about these objects is, is whether there is not, in addition to this clear social function, another function, whether that memorial function that I imagined from growing up in 20th century America is not in some way present here also. Does, this not, does the donation of this object not mean something also about perpetuating the memory of an individual or a family? Although we have no indication from the, from the object itself at this point that it does. And I'm going to skip to a second phenomenon. Um, we'll come back and put them together again in the end, I hope. I want to talk about a, a liturgy that was prevalent throughout Europe, throughout Ashkenaz in any case, uh, during early modern times, a uh, ritual of Haskarat Nishamot. What we have here are three pictures from a manuscript that's most widely known in the literature as the Alt Neuschel Memorbuch. Yerushalmi writes about Memorbucher as the place where we write rolls of the dead. Um, I actually think that this particular manuscript is not, its primary importance is not as, as material culture. It's merely a reminder of a liturgy that existed, uh, that took place on most Sabbath mornings throughout the year, along with other supplications, following the public recitation of the weekly Torah portion and the re preceding the return of the Torah scroll to the Ark. The ritual of Haskarat, Haskarat Nishamot existed alongside other synagogue memorials for the dead, such as those included in the liturgies of Yom Kippur and the last days of each of the three pilgrimage festivals known as Yizkor, in which individual congregants prayed separately at a set joint time for the souls of their own relatives, which also took place in this place in early modern Prague. The terminology is somewhat confusing because today's Yizkor, what we today know as Yizkor, is sometimes also referred to as Haskarat Nishamot. But in this ceremony of Haskarat Nishamot, which existed, I said again, simultaneously, uh, the cantor leading this part of the service read a number of entries from the synagogue's, what we know as a memorabucher, but I'm going to call it Pinkas Haskarat Nishamot, a notebook for the remembering people, also known as memorabook or a Sefer Zichronot. In later literature and catalogs, they're also sometimes known as a Kuntrasbe Knesset, because they contain, and here we have the clear parallel to medieval Christian uh, practice, necrologies, but also a variety of prayers. Each entry or Hazkara contained a prayer for the soul of a deceased individual or a couple, or occasionally a group of people. The groups of people are usually for martyrs who die in a single act of, martyr of martyrdom. By uttering the supplication at a specific time in the service, the cantor created a liturgical bridge from the world of the living worshipers to that of the dead congregants recalled, bringing those individuals into the present service as passive objects of its prayers. Not every dead member of the synagogue was included. 
Rather, rather, this right had to be purchased by the deceased before his death or her death, or afterward purchased by a family member or otherwise earned. The only other way to earn it, as far as the ones that I've seen in Prague, is through an act of martyrdom. Those are the only people who are recalled in this liturgy who is not specifically related that, that the entry was paid for, although ritual objects are often mentioned as a part of the payment, that they, this person should, the so-and-so should, should be remembered because uh, their father or brother or daughter or son gave this money, and it's also mentioned that they gave such and such an object, usually unfortunately in pretty vague terms instead of in terms of what exactly that object was. These are three different pages from the, Haskarat Nish, the, the book of Haskarat Nishamot uh, from the Altnoy Shul, and they're sort of backwards, and then I start on the left. This page, we, where you see several entries, one after the other, where each one begins, Yizkor, Elohim, et nishma kach v'kach, b'avor shenatan kach v'kach, et e nishmato tzvura b'tzvura chayim. May God remember this individual because he gave such and such amount of money, uh, and may his soul be bound in the bond of life, the same formula that appears on the gravestone. So here we have one, two, three, four, probably five on an individual page. This is, I, I forgot to double check, late 14th, early 15th century. The Altnoy Shul member book begins around the 14th century. This is a set, another page from later on, from the 17th century, where we, it looks like two, it's actually three different entries here. But at the same period, you'll have one for Rabbi Yudalel, for the Maharal of Prague, that it takes an entire page for a single entry. And here in the early 18th century, we have someone who was Gabbai of the Altnoy Shul at that period, who has in tiny Rashi script writing an entire page devoted to a single entry, and keep in mind that these are not, the, not only the names are read at the end of the Torah service, but the entire, whatever is written here is read wor verbatim, word by word. Uh, each person who's remembered there is recalled. So that, so on the one hand we have, uh, I've looked a little bit at a ritual object that is donated, period. Now we see a liturgy for the remembering of individuals from the synagogue, and I want to go, Rachel, yeah. Can I interrupt just for a second? I'm sorry, I, I just Please. didn't quite follow the way you were saying it. These are recited by the cantor after the, the Torah reading ceremony at the same time that people are doing something private? For no, 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 that they exist simultaneously in the same year. No, the, those, the private yisker that we know on the three pilgrimage festivals oh, exists. This is not one or the other. But what happens every Sabbath, except not every Sabbath, it turns out to be about more, a little bit more than half the Sabbaths of the year because on the days... Uh, on certain days that is excluded, which tend to be the days that also don't have Avarach Amim, or they do have a, a, a Rosh Chodesh, and then if there's a wedding and so forth, it's excluded. So it turns out to be something about 60% of the Sabbaths of the and year. each person would be read once Each year. person would be read. And the notebooks tend to include, in addition to these, the prayers for the Emesha Berach, for the end of the Torah service, everything that you, they tend to include more or less what you would need after the Torah scroll is put away until the beginning of Musaf. So if there's any other prayers to be said in addition to reading off these names, those tend to be included in these same manuscripts, every synagogue having its own version. Every synagogue keeps its own, and most of them, as we'll see later on, will be replaced as they wore out, and for other reasons. And so we have very few from this period. We have a couple from this period. Most of the ones we have are from the 19th century. So did, did the, I mean, since they weren't entered by the date. They were not read by the date. Uh, were they read? No, in this period, when you see the 19th century books, they sometimes recall them by date, but they were not read. There does not seem to be, from anything I've seen, in the 17th century in Prague, there doesn't seem to be any connection between the day a person died and the day that the entry was read in the synagogue. They go, they go from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. They try to accomplish the book in a year-long cycle, but, it, but it's just chronological. A certain number of pages. A certain, right, or a certain number of minutes, wow. however. It, uh, mm -hmm. And this is not just in Prague. This is throughout. If you look at them, if you look carefully at the member book from Frankfurt, from Worms, from every place else that we have them from, this seems to be the model. And then I'm saying that this should not, that these books, these objects, and here in a conference on material culture, I'm saying we shouldn't look at these as material culture primarily. I mean, obviously that's also important, but these are primarily a key to key us into a liturgy uh, the way that it took place earlier and, and was discontinued for obvious reasons that, that we'll get on. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question actually it's also related to the people that uh, Vivian was showing us. If in fact the fact that they're inscribed doesn't add a level of some level of materiality or, or a special kind of materiality to an object, whether it's oh, absolutely. A painting a piece of yeah. uh, parchment. No, no, abs so absolutely. It the, 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 the makes them sacred, holy, but also so from a different category of objects from the moment they're inscribed, because you can't throw them away, you have to take right, care the, of them. The books, not just the textiles. Yeah, no, it's, abs yeah, it's yeah, absolutely. In the same way that a Siddur, I mean, I'm, I'm, all I'm saying, I'm not saying that it's not material culture also. All I'm saying is the same way that you would look at any prayer book 
as both material culture and symbolic and, and trying through it to reconstruct something else that is even less real for us than material culture, a ritual that happened, this is said this should be looked at it the same way. Obviously the, the manuscript is important, the kinds of writing that are important, the, the way that the hand handwriting changes from the fifteenth to the sixteenth to the eighteenth century, all those material elements are important and the fact that the name has it does make it holy and it doesn't get thrown out except that it seems, as far as I can tell, in the early 20th century when the ghetto in Prague was raised to the ground in order to build a new, better, cleaner uh, quarter of Prague, we do not have, this is a very skewed sample in that the ones that have survived, not only are most of them from the 19th century, they are exclusively from the synagogues that survived. So whatever, at that point, whatever belonged to the Great Court Synagogue, whatever belonged to the, to the synagogue where Kafka's bar mitzvah was, was, the Spanish synagogue survived, in some, but they, they, yeah, they don't exist. So the ones that we have are from the surviving synagogues. We don't have uh, from the others. Who, who composed these different nuschaot? Some are more elaborate, some aren't, you know, who gets to They are, it? on average, they become more elaborate as time goes on. Uh, and not clear who composed them, whether it was the scribe, whether it was the family. In the beginning, they're very uniform. So in the 14th, 15th century, they're extremely uniform. If you look in the normal year, but then they're not. And so it, and do they match? They don't exactly match the gravestones. When, in, the, in the rare cases where we have a gravestone and we have a Haskara, they're not identical. But not only that, they're very honorific. And so uh, yeah, exactly. Um, it, it, but they do function in a similar way as a gravestone, that you could read them the same way and try to understand the new scholars and try to understand what's formulaic and what's not formulaic. There's one for the Shelah. Uh, there's one that's the schlock I can remember, who gets to make everybody wait an extra five minutes uh, while they're doing uh, Excellent <laughs> question. I wish I had the answer. It's a, it's a real, and we'll, we'll get the... Do you know, okay, much, do you know that. The, the value of, uh, of getting one of those? <laughs> I don't know, and I wish I did. They don't have, these don't have any prices in them. They, they don't have any, yes? Add to your, um, to the answer to your question, there, there are um, silver beakers and cups and so forth that are identical to Kiddush cups. The only difference is that one has a Hebrew inscription and the other doesn't. And that it, even aside from inscriptions, it's the use of an object which will make it Kodesh or not. For example, if you use a textile to be a mantle, it has to be treated in a certain way after it no longer functions as a mantle. Whereas it's not a dress that you're just throwing in the garbage. So, but is there a difference if the inscription is in Hebrew or the inscription is in a different There may language? not be an inscription. You could, I, th I, I took the example of the uh, mantle because you can be without an inscription. And it still becomes. A, a, it's the use of it to cover the Torah that makes it, that renders it holy. In, in Bohemia, you don't have inscriptions in any language besides Hebrew until the 19th century. You yeah. have to see Czech. Well, that's and true and generally. So I, I, I don't say it in Bohemia because yeah. that's what I know. Um, no, right, it, it, is. It, it, it is true generally. Um, so that doesn't even. Was there sometimes a reluctance to inscribe things on some objects because then on the walls of the synagogues there are many to what about this whether you can paint the walls again if the, the name of God is mentioned or not. There are many discussions yeah. about that if you want. So this is, a, in a nutshell, Haskarat Neshamot, there's a lot that we could say about it. It has very strong parallels, the, and there's a real question whether this is more, when you see the set, when you suddenly jump into Prague in 1601, is this, this obviously grows out of certain things that happened, according to most of the scholarship, this goes out of certain things that happened following the First Crusades and the memorials for the First Crusades, and this evolves into this current state in Prague. Uh, but they're clearly very strongly influenced by different kinds of necrologies and churches and monasteries and so forth, and the way that those were used are similar and are different. And I. The question that bothers me that I have no answer to is this, after it's born in Germany in the middle, in the earlier Middle Ages, does it evolve into this, or does this have some kind of relationship with what's going on in contemporaneous Prague and the churches in Prague? I have no idea. Prague is, however, a, a very heterogeneous city in 1601 in terms of its Christianity, its ethnic, linguistic, uh, cultural makeup with Italians and Germans and Czechs and Protestants of different kinds and Catholics and Jesuits and, and all sorts. So, so there's not any one place to look. Uh, to compare this particular ritual to what's going on in Prague. There's many, many places to look. Uh, jumping back to the ritual objects and how they might, in fact, to the question of whether somebody regarded them as a way of looking at memory, of remembering person. This is the earliest hint that I've found in an inscription from a ritual object from Prague. This is a mantle. You can see that it's smaller. It still has, it doesn't have the two columns, but it has the basic outline of a, of a fine, uh, fabric in the middle surrounded by other fabric and topped by an, uh, an inscription. This mantle actually on the other, on the back side continues. It was restored in, uh, do I have it down here, in 16, 
1703. Thank you. I wrote it down right there. <laughs> I can't find it. Um, and the descendants write on the back side that they completed it. So we have some kind of interaction there in 1703 between the present and the past, uh, a family's patrimony in the public space of the synagogue and how that's preserved. Uh, in terms of memory, this is the first time that, we've, that I have seen the words um, that this was a gift of Lieberman Hoffman and his wife Sarah, Zecher uh, Asa, to the accounting. So he made, he made a memory. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean a memory like we think a memory. They did something that should be recalled. I mean, the, the, if you look in a concordance, if you look at the different uses of Zecher, uh, of the root, that basically means to remember in this point, this, it, it could be just to remind somebody. They, it's, it's not exactly clear what the meaning is here. Um, let me just throw in another aside while we're looking at this mantle, mm -hmm. is that there's a very strong connection between the textiles and women and memorial in Prague. When it says there are places where textiles mention that a woman made, uh, that a woman made it, and, and so maybe there's something, even though it's in the masculine, maybe there's something with that. It's not entirely clear what they mean by that he made a memory by giving the mantle, but there's some sort of association here between the idea of remembering something and, and the donation of the object. I'm certainly open to any interpretations that, that somebody might have. Uh, another kind of Why view. Do you think that was homemade as I don't think this one was homemade. Uh, as I said, I'm th throwing in that uh, it's because it's Zech Zechar Assad brings up the question whether one of the people in this family actually made this mantle. No, not necessarily. Not so at all. It's okay. Like a okay. Uh, and and really more. And then it's of a type that was made in workshops. It's absolutely made in a workshop, but does the family, and I don't think this family does, but when you look at the pearl stickers and similar kinds of instructions, does the, does the family part of the workshop in some way? In Prague, we do have people who are involved in the production. Well, but they named it, they said that. Okay. Yeah. But whether they made it or not, um, well, we'll see other places where there's a connection. I, I threw one for later. Uh, when you see the silk, and then uh, in terms of the connection between uh, I'll talk about the connection between women and, and the textiles in a little bit. Um, this is a different kind of, this inscription also, I, I brought it for two reasons, this, um, this object. One being that it shows us, <laughs> because I'm not an art historian, I don't have the proper vocabulary, but just by looking, you can see that a, a parochet made. Can I just go back yeah. to the Zehra Asaf for a moment? Yeah. And the date, the use of the Asaf for date. Right. Just as a, you want to suggest that Zechor Asaf suggests some idea of perpetuating their own name. My only question is, if books published in the same year use the same... Zechor Asaf? That's why I'm just wondering whether it gets picked I mean, up. I'm not sure. I'm suggesting, I'm raising the question whether this means something about perpetuating. It's the earliest that I've seen any connection in terms of the language know, the and the restrictions. Just, I'm but here's a way to control the, and check. To look at books, that's an interesting uh, idea. Uh, I haven't... Uh, you're right. I mean, usually the verses are selected so that they have some additional meaning. I mean, right. not just the uh, verse uh, that is in the same moment. It adds something right. to the. Uh, we said that, and I didn't say it out loud for, for people, it's not clear. When it says Zecher Asa, the first word, the root for memory, and the second word, the root for made or did, Ayin Shin Hei, with the, you can see the little. Um, these little symbols mm -hmm. on the top of the letters indicate that these are not, this is not only a word, but that it has other meaning. And what it is is that this is the numerology that adds up to the year of donation, 1615 or 1614 or 15. Uh, that, that, the, that, that these clue us in that those are the three letters whose no numerical values we need to add up in order to understand, in order to figure out what the year was. That's where the way the date is coded into the inscription with this, the, the second part for anybody. Uh, this means le katan to the small, which is has to do with the way of reckoning the Hebrew year. Le katan, it's a abbreviation yeah, of le fat katan. Yeah, yeah. They the abbreviate the abbreviation. Um, the but I'm not going into the whole thing. That the, takes a whole the, class. The of the community in Poznan is known as Sefer Sechronot, mm. which, as I understand it, isn't. I mean, it is connected with the idea of memory, but it's things which are notable. Exactly. And, and I think. That seems to be more the sense of, well, this is not with memory, it's just something notable that we... Uh, right, yeah. right. I mean, that's, that's why I'm saying that I'm reluctant to say this is absolutely about memory, but it is still, even when you say that it's something notable, there is some sort of intellectual connection between something notable and something we need to... In, in, in roughly the same period, and, and uh, published, in fact, in Prague, is Aboab Sefer as it were which, is which doesn't mean different. memory at all, but it's notitiae, some, yeah. some mm -hmm. sort of. Right, right, which is, uh, all examples strengthening my question whether this is really what that's about, but it clearly, um, 
but in terms of linguistic search history of mentalities to look for the use of the word, this is the first per place that I've that I've seen it. Again, we don't know what what doesn't exist from the from the 16th century in terms of objects. There, as I said, there were at least partial expulsions during the 16th century. Uh, a very small community at the end of the 16th century and just beginning. It, it's not clear. Uh, there there were Jews in Prague certainly many hundreds of years prior, and we don't know what they used or how they had. Um, so when you look at the at the this very <coughs> typical parochet from Prague and another from Mlada Boleslav, which is uh, known in different names in German, Bumsla in Hebrew and Yiddish sources. Uh, you can see that there are similarities, but that, that uh, it's sort of an example of even something else in another part of Bohemia really looks different from the parochot in Prague, and I won't, uh, I'll leave it to the experts to describe how. This includes language that is often comes up in the Haskarat Nishamot, um, and this is the earliest place, again, that I haven't done a completely thorough search. This is the earliest place I've seen it on an object, which is that the donor, and here you have what I was talking about before, Maaseya Deha, that this is a work of her, uh, that this person gave. This is an interesting inscription for other reasons. So it was given, um, and that seemed to be out of order, but that it was um, given by Yaakov, son of Anshel, and his wife, Miss Slava, daughter of Ozer, I'm leaving out all the honorifics which are significant, um, that it's the work of her hand to be glorified by, that she left it after her. Now in this case this woman seems to have died before the parochia was actually donated and it literally means that she left it after her. In the Haskarat Nishamod and in later ritual objects what Hinia HaKharav left it after him usually is, literally means bequeathed and, no, and nothing, nothing more simple and nothing more complicated. Usually it's used um, when it means left after him, he left money to be included in the Sefer Haskarat and Sarot in order to, to have a, a memorial prayer said. He left money after him. You can translate it bequeathed with no problem at all. Um, this is one of the earliest places I've seen that, as I said, on a textile as opposed to in a manuscript. And here it seems to be something much more complicated because it seems to indicate that this woman, as opposed to the previous uh, mantle, may have actually started, either she commissioned this to start being made, but in any case it wasn't finished when, when she was done. Um, and she did it for a memory before God, which again is a word, use of the word zecha, use of the word, root word for memory without necessarily meaning what we mean by memory. It means that, that God should know them, that God should remember them for God's glory. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, that the family should be remembered. Um, and this has this very unusual thing that it was given by this man and his wife, apparently his second wife, um, daughter of somebody else. So it seems from the inscription, and I, don't, I haven't been able to follow this farther, that, that this couple started to give, the, give uh, started the process of either commissioning or having made or, or somehow this, this parochet, and then the woman died, eventually the man remarried, we don't know how much time, and they finished and gave the object. So th that does have a particular, if that's true, that does have particular uh, I implications for how the object was seen, but the one part that I do want to highlight is that in terms of things that appear on objects, these words that they left after them, especially toward the later 17th century, there are many more objects, it just means bequeath. This person thought before he died to bequeath this object that would then serve, continue to serve his own memory after he died. Yeah. It's, uh, and there is a parallel, obviously, with the, with the Christian world, where they uh, commission and bequeath things so that their name is said during Mass every right. year. Right. But what I wanted to point out is that the name, her name is a Slavic name here. She is not named after her whatever Jewish name would have been. Is that unusual? Though? She probably doesn't have. <laughs> For, okay. Um, so it's a ritual of if, even if you look in the Evan Shoshan that no, has a compendium of... So no, 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 but the, the problem is that there are not enough. The, the, the many more women have... Men in, Bo in Bohemia tend to have even three names, not just two, because they have a Hebrew name that they're called to the Torah by, they have a Yiddish name that they're known by in the Jewish community, and they have a Czech and maybe even also a German name that they appear in documents as. And not uh, yeah. translated. Uh, translated, and certainly they'll be translated right between German and Czech. They won't be uh, phonetically done. Um, if this is an unfinished product, it's a perfect example of a, of a layout, of a sketching out the motif that will be filled in. Oh, okay, no, no, this is finished. When, when the woman it died, finished. it wasn't finished. Okay. Yeah, and this is certainly, if, but in the in the cities that were not in the center, in Mlada Vlomoslav, it's not as elaborate. I, I know, but, but you, do you have other examples that are even close to this? Yeah, um, from, if you look, I think, I don't know, what do you, uh, there are other examples like this from the peripheral cities. I, I have to, it, it, there's so a you, folk element to this piece that is very different from the uh, planned Zox curtain which was made in a workshop and, and the, the folk I think that 
looking at it, the, the surround yeah, and the yeah. registers below the loophole are all something that existed before and that were patched together and that and then this this luchot is a very folky thing, along with the banding of the of the inscription. So I think that it, the relationship of the whole thing to the Masa Yodeha is is very complicated. Could it, I mean, could yeah. it not be that she actually made it? I mean, it the, the plain sense of that text is that she actually I made it. I certainly am not going to rule it out. Then, like then you could say completed. she could have she could have made the bottom and then they added the inscription later on. That's possible. Of course she didn't quite finish. I don't see what your problem is with just seeing the, the words as meaning she bequeathed it. In other words, what's well, a formula from a yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it usually does mean she bequeathed it. I'm yeah, raising a possibility that in this... Want to say, say that I, here, I'm saying I'm that, that in this why. singular case, maybe it means something else. I'm, I'm saying... Sorry, not on text You find it over and over again, and you should make the woman What? No, 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 it's because it's because of the Masaya Deha. Yeah, Masaya Deha. Yeah, that's why. The Hiniya Chachara, I'm saying, is is she seems to have been the mid process. Usually, when you see bequeathed, it's a purposeful, is they purposely bequeathed it. In this place, she was in the process of bequeathing it, and then she died before she could even do that. But I don't think it's necessary. Okay, I'm raising I'm raising possibilities. In terms of the folksy, um, that is more characteristic of cities outside of Prague, in Bohemia and in Moravia, where it would also be yeah. folksy, but a different kind of folksy than in Prague. In Prague, you won't see those, at least among the extant parochal, which again are from the most established, the most. We don't have objects from the little shtibla that somebody this, ran his house. This community, Mladovo, is an extremely important, wealthy community. Commissioned textiles from Prague. In fact, one of the valences that you referred to in the beginning um, was, well, there were only two seven or ten of them, and they're extremely elaborate, and they commissioned one of them to be made for them. This is an extremely old Jewish community and very well respected within Bohemia. This is not some little place in the sticks. Nevertheless, it may have been that also in Prague there were both elaborate commissioned objets d'art parochot and also some other kind that we don't have. But the two certainly exist side by side in other, in other cities, much more than in Prague from, from what survived. Um, and another way that a woman in particular connects herself to the idea of memory through the donation of a ritual object appears again in one of the uh, notebooks of memorials uh, where I found, may God remember the soul of the modest woman, Mrs. Razel, I'm skipping a little, because she instructed her husband before her death mm -hmm. that he should make a parochet before the Holy Ark from one of her dresses. So mm -hmm. here we have a direct evidence of the connection and, and right in the, in the volume that Vivian ed edited with Eliezer Diamond translating, there are more she go to talk about this idea of giving it, whether you can give an actual dress, but here we have an example of someone who did. Uh, presumably an expensive silk <laughs> dress that's a one-of-a-kind thing for a woman to own. And her husband uh, upheld her words and also spent a great deal of his own money for her soul. In other words, he took her dress as she instructed it and added, spent a lot of money to have it made into a beautiful parochet. And he had made a holy parochet using one of her dresses with six silver bells so that her soul would be remembered and so on and so forth. So this is a way, but there does seem, when, when I looked at the numbers, um, of all, in the Haskarat Neshamot, there are of, uh, of overwhelming, although they exist for men and women and for couples, there are many more for men. And I can't remember the, the exact breakdown, but there's like 75% much, many more for men. But when you look at the ones that mention ritual object, it becomes much closer to half. So there is something going on here where, where women feel particularly, or at least in the records that have reached us, there's a particular connection between a woman's conception of remembering and, and uh, there's some different ways that we the can... dress can simply be a practical thing, that the women's dresses have more fabric, oh, yeah. and therefore Absolutely. could have been used <laughs> rather than the men's clothes. But, but still, <laughs> it's a very interesting thing in terms of uh, reusing women's clothes into ritual objects like that. So that At least one Polish responsible you have to have a man's coat, I think, we really yeah. 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 Um, in Islamic communities, it's customary to give scarves of the women to put in the Torah. Scroll. And you see that, I saw that this summer in Jerusalem, in the Nasat Sefer Torah, dedicating a new say, and Torah scroll where it's coming through the streets and, and, and they decorate it with women's scarves. Um, what we have then is objects, what I've hoped that I've proven until now, we have objects that have a name of a person or of two people, or, or sometimes a chevra, as we mentioned. 
on them. We have a book that indicates the existence of a ritual whereby people were remembered in the synagogue, sometimes partly for giving an object. And so I'm going to claim that there's some sort of consciousness anytime you give an object that part of its function may be this remembering me, that, that I be remembered in this place after my death. And if we could match the two up, find a place where somebody is remembered and the object exists, then we would have even stronger evidence that there's a strong connection between these two phenomena. And that's what we have in a few cases from Prague. One of them is this mantle given by uh, the Spira family, Wolf, uh, excuse me, Aaron Shimon Spira, Spira and his wife. Uh, this individual was the chief rabbi of Prague. This, don this mantle was donated in 1662, approximately. He was the rabbi of Prague from 1640 till he died in he was 1679. The last chief rabbi of both Bohemia and Moravia. Right, he was the, the until, last one until David, David Oppenheim yeah. uh, in the early 18th century. And he came after. A, he came after a period when there was no chief rabbi because of internal conflict within the Prague period, I mean, within the Prague Jewish community, and what followed him was was extremely nasty, bitter infighting in the Prague Jewish community, and again the impossibility of, of appointing first a rabbi at all, and then for for, for both and so forth. He was um, uh, his son being one of the people who contended for that position uh, with some success. So uh, this was donated by by him and his wife. Um, after he'd already been in that position for a good many years. And a, a memorial prayer in a manuscript that I'm not sure what its function is. It's in Cincinnati today. It's a little different some, from some of the other ones that exist. But in any case, what it says is, in part, it goes on. It has, it's quite a long inscription. I don't, I don't know. It's a, about a half a page typed to read the whole thing in Aramaic and rabbinic language and all sorts of beautiful analogies and references and so forth, but includes this line, because he dedicated to the Altnoishol a Torah scroll with gilded rods, with fine silks interwoven with gold, uh, in order to fulfill the verse, this is my God and I will glorify him, which is from the Song of Songs, and, and the verse that is used as the textual basis of the importance of giving beautiful ritual objects, why does this matter in the system of Jewish command, and it matters because of this verse, this is my God and I will glorify him. And so we have here specifically said it that he gave uh, something that was um, fine silks interwoven with gold. And, and then we have this mantle that indeed is inter interwoven with, with gold. Another example, um, again, a woman in one of the only professions of women noted both on the gravestones and on ritual objects. This is a midwife uh, named Bela, Hibam being the German Jew, a German and German Jewish equivalent in this case of Mialedit, which is what it says in the, in the inscription given by the woman, it says Isha Chashuva, which is more than an important woman, it, it, some sort of indication of status. The midwife, Mrs. Bela, daughter uh, of Zalman Sofar, and again this has also a backside that continues the inscription. And again, in one of the uh, Pinkasim, in one of the notebooks in one of the Prague synagogues, it says specifically that um, this is, that the memorial is said for Rabbi Mordechai Dayan, and his pi wife, the pious Bela Hibam, daughter of our teacher Rabbi Zalman, because Bela vowed and dedicated to the charity of the high synagogue for her husband and for her daughter a Torah scroll with silver rods above, and also a beautiful mantle and a shield of silver. So again, these references are fairly vague. You can't say 100% this is the mantle. It's not described well enough. But we, here we have a mantle from Prague. We have a Haskara from Prague that uh, really does seem to indicate the same piece. And indeed, we have something similar with the Zach's, um that in, and this is, doesn't appear anywhere else. It seems that the Hezkara starts in the middle of a line here, and somebody later on wrote down to add the words Yizkor Elohim, may God remember, before he starts the new um, Hezkara for Nathan Zacks. May God remember the soul of the leader, ruler of the people of our holy community here in Prague, who spent most of his days on earth attending to the needs of the public in good faith. And thanks to his lobbying, they found shelter in dangerous times. I have no idea what particular incident that may be referring to, but this is a person who is at least being remembered for being active in the community. It is he who, with honor and glory, brought to the house of our Lord. This is in the book that I'm sorry. Um, it is he who, with honor and glory, brought to the house of our Lord a Torah scroll with rods of silver, a Torah curtain, and the rest of the holy accoutrements, costing several hundred. This is the closest I have to a number, and I have no idea several hundred what. Um, and sanctified them, and he gives more uh, verses in his honor. He stood on level ground and went on a straight path. The Honorable Na Rabbi Nathan, son of Issachar, called Karpel Zaks. And again, 
all that's not good enough to be included in the ritual weekly m memorial. He, his son-in-law, the Rabbi Av Avinadav David, gave charity for his eternal memory of his soul, and may his, uh, by this merit, may his soul be bound in the bond of life with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And, and this is the, the formula. So here we have um, a specific reference. And w once we have this, this memory in liturgical time, invoking the parochet that was given in the person's life, we, we have a, really an ongoing way that the person continues to function in that space beyond his life. He's remembered for giving the parochet. We see the parochet. We happen to have, in this case, this is extremely rare to have this kind of evidence, a, a manuscript from the late 18th or 19th century that gives some of the rotations of ritual objects in the synagogues in Prague. And we are told that a Nathan Zach, uh, Karpel Zax is mentioned as a person that doesn't describe the object. There are five different Torah curtains hung in the process of Yom Kippur. One has to be taken up and put down and taken up and put down in order to get everybody at the right time. This is connected to a date much more than the person's day of death. So the, the Haskarot seem to be read whenever they come up during the year, but there are very, very strict regimens designed for exactly when you use the items and display the items, not necessarily according to the day the person died, but according to all sorts of other considerations and stipulations of the donations. Um, and we know that a uh, uh, mantle given by Karpel Zaks was one of five rotated in the Alt Neuschel for, for hundreds of years after his death. Uh, and, and I would claim that that is a way of that person who was obviously had a great deal of his life, at least according to this inscription, involved and invested in that space and in that community to continue to function there in ways that medievalists, medievalists have written about the dead continuing to function in a society after their death. This person uh, continues to function in that space even after his death. For a woman, it takes on a slightly different meaning as a woman who gives an object is then part of um, the men's synagogue, the central part of the Torah reading and so forth, even though she's not physically present, she's, I would say, I would claim perhaps investing some of herself in that space despite her physically standing in a different space during in the actual synagogue. Uh, at least that's a possible interpretation. So I think that these things, that this person, whether or not he did it, whether or not he gave this object for his own memory, certainly must have been, in my opinion, aware that that is part of what it functions for. And that must be, in my opinion, part of what he donates it, at least with awareness that that, that will help him, perhaps with other considerations as well. And I certainly don't want to negate the, the interpretations that talk about the family's social status and all the other functions of gift giving and ritual object display and consumption and so forth that we've talked about. And I really do think that things go together. I think especially when we look at, uh, at the work of like, uh, people like Patrick Geary, which is for several hundred years earlier, but still functions in a certain way, that this person is functioning uh, beyond his death in this space. And that also is part of the family's social status after his death. And, the same, and uh, another example that I would give is what Natalie Zeman Davis wrote many years ago in an article about kith, kin, and progeny, the, and the way that Protestant families started to plan their family's status beyond the death of the people um, I'm not, this is not going to work exactly the same way, but there are some of those elements of planning for a family status even beyond the death of the patriarch or of the individual donor, where these two elements of social status and gift giving that have been developed go side by side with the memorial function uh, perpetuating the family's patrimony in this particular space. Uh, that's as far as the particular Zach's parochet. And, and some of the things that I would suggest about its role for memory, I'd certainly be happy to hear more. Um, but there's two other changes that go on during the course of the 17th century, one that I can pin more specifically on the early modern period. The first one that I'll talk about, however, is more speculative in, in terms of what's special about the early modern period and how the role of ritual objects and memory develop in this period. Um, the first of these two changes is that we do begin to see in the later part of the 17th century, and if uh, somebody has seen this for earlier, I would be very happy to hear about it. Um, people who do give an object in memory of a person who has died. And again, it may exist earlier without an inscription. We just saw that that object may have a purpose that's not written. The inscriptions get must, much later, but I just know that we begin to see it here. Again, in 1689, there was a horrific fire in the Jewish quarter in Prague, uh, uh, left standing of 318 houses. There were fewer than 10 left standing. Everybody had to go live someplace else. The synagogues were destroyed. Uh, another comment on the importance of material culture in Prague is that in songs, and in El Mali Rachami Memorial Pair commemorating these events, one of the things that's continually mentioned is the ritual objects that were lost. And that's mentioned alongside the, the Torah scrolls that were lost. This is something that's significant to the community. All by way of saying that, that that is only speculation of how these people may have died. Um, 
the people for whom this parachet was given in, in, in the following year, in 1690, it reads, as a memory before God for the sake of the Kiddoshim, the martyrs, uh, which is a term used in this period for anybody who died an unnatural death. They could certainly have been called that for dying in a fire. They didn't have to be killed in, in some kind of anti-Jewish massacre. Dale, the wife of the elder, the leader, our teacher, Rabbi Moses Abelis, uh, the Reish He means Rosh HaKahal, head of the community. That does not mean he was the Parnas or the head of the community. There are two boards of five each, Rosh HaKahal and Tuve HaKahal. He's one of five. I'll bring to that, but he was at different points. Moses Abelis was a leader of the proud Jewish community. Um, may God protect and bless him for their son. Uh, our teacher, Rabbi Yosef, and his wife, Gidala, daughter of our teacher. I must say his wife, I must have written that down. For, for memory before God, for the, for the sake of the martyrs, Dela, wife, sorry, wife of um, Moshe Abelis. So it's specifying that she gave the object, but for the death of, of but for this, her shared son with her husband and his wife, Yosef and Gidala. Um, no. No? She, she is one of the Kedoshim, no? No, she's the donor. No, it says, uh, I can't read it, Leman. Hey, there's no period there, but ha- it should be. Leman HaKedoshim. But, but the only way to read it is to put a period there. That's how it looks at first, but the only way to read the whole thing is to then say period. Zichron lifnei Hashem liman hakadoshim, period. Otherwise, otherwise it would be a zel or something, as there are in the other cases. It would be right. a zel after, and there's no zel there. Because we saw in the, in the Karpel Zaks parochet that it just has his name. That's sort of the, 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 the typical way to have a, 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 mant, a, a parochet is it has the name on it. So that's what people are used to reading. People are used to reading that. I, I'm only guessing. I, I have no other way to read it grammatically all the way through, and that's that, that poor grammatical syntax is not uh, certainly right. something that's rare among Jews of late 17th century Prague, so we have to deal with it as best we can. So it seems like if you put the punctuation, as memory before God, period, or as memory before God for the honor of the Kedoshim, period. New, new paragraph. I a new paragraph, right? It should have been on the next line, but that doesn't that's fit right. artistically. Yeah. And now that's we have. Right. It should have been like, there should have been a colon there. That's, that's right. As there would have been. Right. right. Dela, that's wife of the Aluf, the Rosh, the Katsin, uh, our esteemed Rabbi Moses Abelis, who, uh, Rosh Kaha, may his memory be, be, be for a blessing, Avur, for their son, that can only be her son and Moshe Abelis's son, mm-hmm. who is the esteemed Rabbi Yosef, may his memory be for a blessing, and his wife Gidala, daughter of the um, Aluf, her, she's also dead already, um, and also for their sons, the Kedushim. In other words, both Yosef and Gidala and their children died, perhaps in the fire. I don't have any other explanation, but there could be another one. Um, and the mother, Dela, gave this in their memory. Ho- however we read it, it's given in memory of someone, and this is a case by the late 17th century where we do have somebody saying on an object, I'm giving this object for the memory of someone. I would propose, I have no proof of this, that that really begins with these kinds of unnatural deaths and that you only see a grandparent memorialized in this way later on. Um, but again, I, I'm doing that based on the objects that I've seen. I couldn't prove that yet. I would use that as a working hypothesis and, and find as many inscriptions as I could. There seems to be more of an impulse to be innovative in memorialization when you have that sort of tragic c- circumstance. But again, that's, uh, I'm throwing that out as a question for people to keep in mind, as I'm sure you're all just going to leave here and go looking for all the lists of inscriptions. Right, I that think you can, you'd have to go through them. Right. You, you would have to. I'm saying it's a question to take to the lists. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether it's true or not. But let me phrase it that way instead of questions to take to the lists. Um, and again, it, they become much longer. It's hard to know. It, the, the function could have existed for 100 years before it was ever written on an inscription. Just the fact that somebody decides that, they, that the technology becomes better, that they become more wealthy, that they're able to write these very long, gold inscripted inscriptions doesn't necessarily mean that people didn't do it with the same intention earlier on. It's, it's very hard to... Um, I can just one suggestion. Yeah. I understand, but the material culture, but certainly the idea of a mishabera when somebody gives money for some in the name, right? So that existed. So I think you're right, saying that there's a transfer here of something that existed before, and moving on to something. Whether this is the earliest, that's just I, mean, I, I don't think know, I haven't followed all the way through. Clearly, by the 19th century, it's extremely common, but yeah, I haven't. I haven't followed it just it before, all the way, just in a different way. All the way. I, I think you mentioned the transition uh, in technique that occurs in the inscriptions. Uh, the Carpal Zox inscription is seed pearl oh, embroidery, sorry. as oh, is the I'm other sorry. are the other early. I can't really um, see it. The other two curtains, the, the Mordechai Mizel curtain and the and then, um, pearl sticker, which pearl are the early sticker. ones, for the, the, the other the ones from those periods. Done in this very unusual but 
typical for Bohemia. Um, pearl, seed pearl embroidery, and then you mean there are seed pearls on the thread? Yeah. No, the, the whole the letters actually is formed of seed pearls. Interesting. Tiny, tiny, and tiny then pearls. tiny pearls. Yeah. And then there, um, and then there's the switch when you get into the 17, 16, 10 or so. There's a switch mm -hmm. to metallic. See, embroidery. this is this is metal. Here you can see the metal. You can't see the mm -hmm. well. Still, you can't see it that well. But this is metallic, as opposed to the pearls. But Occasionally, you find one later in the 17th right. century, but it's, it's it's a very luxurious type of embroidery. So you wouldn't have these multiple lines of line after line after line uh, from the pearls. Although well, no, we have one. The, the pearl stick actually has quite a bit. We have a mantle pieces, the inscriptions <coughs> mantle, a lot of lines. The pearls clearly were still extant in the late 18th century because Abraham and Lady saw them, and he remarks on. I mean, that's the quote that I remember. He, he remarks that they stitch the Torah clothing with pearls. So that's and it was used in the church as well. Yeah, I, I have lots of my here from church robberies where they steal the um, altar covers or whatever, and then they cut out the pearls to sell them separately, and then they sell the, uh, the cloth <laughs> for whatever else separately. So you have that. Which is going to reason we may not have so much silver because you melt it down and sell it, won't sure. you? You need it, and then, and then the textiles burn, so the silver may. Are you, are you uh, no, go ahead, though. No, go, no, ahead, go, go ahead. ahead. No, well, uh, okay, there, there's um, one more where they actually bring a piece. That this I'm going to skip over quickly, but but this parochet actually has mentions in the inscription that there's a piece brought from an earlier parochet destroyed in the fire that was incorporated in this one. So that's, an, again, another use of memory and another use of continuing the patrimony of whatever was in that earlier piece um, into a later one. Uh, a gift of the officer and honorable Rabbi Gershon Karpels and his wife, Mrs. Esther, daughter of Baruch Tillis in the year Give, 54-56, 1695-96, for which they used a piece from the parochet of his father's awe, which was saved from the fire in the year um, 1689. So another way that they're very conscious of continuing this thing beyond. I just want to get to, the one thing that I want to get to before we close is the last uh, text that I have there, which is the end of the Hasgarat Nishamot as we knew them. And this is 18... This is a picture, but I should, have, I should have kept it for a minute, but I want to focus on the title page of this book, of which, again, I apologize, I don't have a picture here, but I have the entire text. Uh, as I said, these, these, are literal, literal, these are notebooks that are used day, uh, week in and week out, and the synagogues, they begin to wear down, and they are recommissioned and recopied by a new scribe, but only partly because of the wear and tear. And this uh, title page of one that was written in 1801 for the Pincus Synagogue explains this process um, very elaborately. It says, to inform and to notify. Because of what they had seen, they decided to institute a new Pinkas Askarat Nishamot HaKadoshim, a notebook of commemorations for the holy souls who are in the earth, the buried ones. May their memory be for a blessing. Who gave of their hearts, talks about the purpose of the earlier Haskarat Nishamot, who gave of their hearts and brought sacred vessels and sacred vestments as a memory in the sanctuary of the Lord. And they made an explicit condition that their souls, their names, be remembered on Sabbath and festivals. Here it talks explicitly about what we saw in the earlier process, that they gave these objects that they would be remembered in the Haskarot for having given that object. And indeed, in the Pinkas Haskarot, uh, Pinkas Haskarot that was previously in the Pinkas Synagogue from the year 5461, 1700-1701, a, a manuscript that we don't have, a book in the form of a scroll was written about them, everything they vowed and that they donated, and until now, the cantor, and you could you already imagined this when I said it the first time, would recite from that pincus. However, they wrote there at great length what they vowed, and it is not necessary to recite all this. Reisha declared it for is clear to heaven, and it was a great inconvenience, tirchad et sibora, and it was also impossible to recite more than two or three askarot on a single Shabbat. Because of this, it was impossible, God forbid, to complete the entire pincus in a single year. And it was also impossible to make any sign indicating where the cantor concluded on a particular Sabbath and where another cantor should begin the following week. Because of this, individuals of unique qualities donated to the synagogue to make this new pincus with signs and narrow slots. At the outset, the Haskarot were divided into neat paragraphs, marked with letters, and a defined portion for each Sabbath with a line of separation between them. And a needle will be as a sign to close and open so that the cantor the following Sabbath will begin in the place where the silver needle is fixed, and when he has finished the special portion for that Sabbath, then he will put the needle in the following slot. In this manner, all the mistakes have been corrected, and in order to beautify it, he wrote inside everything that belongs and is needed for the cantor at this hour. That we have decorum. Okay, there's a lot of things going on here. It clearly was very long. 
Um, but in 1801, it's extremely clear to me that we have the entry of decorum. This person's up there. He's guessing. He doesn't know where to begin. He doesn't know where to end. He's flipping around for the other prayer and that prayer. And this is no longer tolerable in 1801 in Prague. In 1801 in Prague, we have to order it, and we have to be neat about it, and we have to have a beginning and an end. And we no longer need to mention all those things. So in terms of that's one point, is, is the importance of the end of this, or the beginning of the end. The ritual still exists, but the ex beginning of the end of this ritual, uh, thanks, in my opinion, partly to this notion of decorum, which has not been sufficiently studied. In terms of the early modern period, there's something else that's going on here, which is that in the medieval period, in the, in the Pinkus scene from Nuremberg and Mainz, in the earliest one that we know, we have these lists, these very short lists that, uh, not good, that, say who, that say who died and say a few things about him. And clearly we have this elaboration going on. This happens a similar process on the gravestones. It's becoming more and more and more elaborate um, until the early 18th century. What you have in this process, as it's growing, as they're becoming more elaborate, is we're saying more about at least the, the elite, if not everybody, um, a, a publification. What, what had sort of been a personal, very neat, orderly beginning memory, one, two, three, we have a, a publication or, or a putting very strong placing of that familial memory in the public space. And even if it's because of decorum, uh, that, that what we have in the 17th and 18th century is nothing like what we had in Mainz and Worms. Uh, in the 12th and 13th century in that way. And it's really a new phenomenon. And, and in this case, we can see the beginning of the end of it very clearly, where part of what begins to kill it is these notions of decorum, that we have to be neat about it. But at the same time, those individual listing of objects is clearly not as important to these people anymore. They are not sorry to see that go. And they're not saying it's too bad. We really want to know what all the objects were, but we just don't have time. This is very clear, at least in this um, text, is a very clear picture of that. And, and I would raise questions about what is that um, that happens. Is there a different concept of family? Is the, is, the, is the early modern concept of family and its patrimony and its social place, is that less important than it was in the early modern period? Is it particular families that now have different values? We have Elkanan Reiner who's written about a lot of changes that happened in the 16th and 17th century in terms of the old elites are dying off and there's new elites and new families and new strategies for them to promote their own interests. Um, and if you read through Reiner's, a few of Reiner's articles, you can see that, and, and some of these things fit in very well with that. So do we have a decline of the importance of family and social stature in general? Do we certainly just have another changing of the guard from the early modern families to a new set of families with a new set of strategies? Um, do we have a decline of the importance of the Torah service as the place where this will be noticed? All these ritual objects and the fact that you give such <laughs> enormous amounts of money are really focused on the, on in space and in time on the Torah, not only on the worship service, but on the Torah and its place in the worship service as the center of everything. Do we have a change? Certainly architecture was important in the Renaissance synagogues, but when you talk about the Berlin synagogues and the, the external show, does the external become even more important than the internal? There's all sorts of uh, possible reasons, and I would, I would throw that out as, as, uh, as a finishing. Yeah. I, um, Farad, an idea that I just had, and, and everyone can say what's wrong with it, other than the fact that there's no proof. I'm all um, so it, assuming that people were giving these objects before as a memorial practice and just weren't writing on them explicitly who they were a memorial to and explicitly the right. way they Well, they would be a memorial to themselves in that case. Or as a memorial to themselves. Let's say, and, and at the same time, the Pinkasim of for Oscar and Mr. Shamal are getting longer and longer, meaning that it will take longer and longer to cycle back to your relative's name. Could, or, or, and people are noticing this. Could that be a reason why later in the 17th century or the 18th century, someone might wish to be more explicit on the object uh, themselves? Because the, oh. uh, the attention of the congregation is going to wander from the lengthy recitation. In other words, as the recitation of names and things gets longer and more boring during the Torah service, people pay less attention. If you really want to memorialize yourself or your relative, you make sure to put it on the object that's actually sitting there uh, in front of people. All the time. It's an interesting thought. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it. I mean, the complaints that we have are from much later. We, I mean, what the, the the text I have is eighteen oh one, and we're talking about a process that happened already in the 1700s, but presumably it's already going on, right? Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. I, it could be, although we do have the change in, in the tech and the technical aspect of how the inscriptions are done, which is very strong. Yeah. If I remember correctly, Carpal's Ox's tombstone exists in the cemetery. I, and in other words, we know when he died. Oh, no, so it, 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 there's, a, there's a way of, of looking at the, um, of correlating 
whether these people, whether the length of the inscription really has to do with the fact the person's alive still when, when it was given. Oh, right. It, that, that is another part of the theory that, in other words, the person gives it for themselves, they're not going to write that I'm giving it for my own. They're only going to write that it's donated by them. Yeah. They're not going to write for my own. Well, the, part, part of the was that when Wiesel gave the Part of the right part, part of the transfer has to be not only between giving for or marking it on the object or not. Part of the, the transfer has to do with whether the primary act is mostly people giving for their own or, or a relative giving it in their memory. You never if, if, it's, if it's a person by by our period we no longer you're never longer going to say it's to perpetuate. Think con maybe other people think consciously. I mean we do do things. I mean that you buy. A slot on the memorial board in the synagogue. People buy those before they die. That's that's the kind of thing that we're talking about, uh, and the transfer to do it for somebody else. Um, right. The memorial things for Mizell become particularly important because he had no children. There's something else. Uh, Zach's, and, and I don't have my whole thing here, and I, I can't remember. But I would want to check if the date of his death doesn't come not from an actual extant gravestone, but from the Hulk book. Where when he doesn't have gravestone, he actually goes back and bases himself on the on the uh, and I, just, I just want to say one other thing about the textiles in the middle of these curtains. Um, <clears throat> the they're all they're all from later. <laughs> no, I, I just want to say that the Jewish Museum itself, before it became more professionalized in the last couple of decades, at times changed uh -huh. the center. And if you look at old photographs, you can see this. And so you really have to be cautious about talking. <laughs> right. Well, luckily I didn't say anything specific about any of the specific <laughs> steps because they... You they the one on the colorful socks, and, and it, I think that one's been there, but there are others... I well, that one may have been there for hundreds of years, but clearly it was changed at some point. I don't think... And yes, it was changed. At some point it was changed, but, but you have to be very careful because they changed. But as far as we know, they were they were the the point was a beautiful f to highlight a beautiful fabric, whatever that fabric originally was. Right. That's not, that's not a, a question and a comment. The question is, do you have any examples in in your material of people who left the synagogue? That is, the children have gone elsewhere, but now give something in memory of the Person family was there. that used to be. And the reason I ask is that in the 18th century in Italy. Uh, one of the things that have people begin moving out of small towns into larger cities, but when they say Kaddish, they go back to the shul where their parents lived in the small town, and they get in fights with local people, people over who has the right to lead the dummy. And it becomes very important to them to be in the place where... So do you have any, any sort of spatial linkage? I, I don't. I mean, we're in the big city, not in the small town. I mean, that question you need to take to the towns in Bohemia more than in Prague, where I've I had this question, and I didn't manage to find so far very much about it. How strong a loyalty does somebody have to the different synagogues? You're talking about a big city with at least eight or nine major synagogues, in, in addition to however many smaller ones there may be. People certainly buy seats that pass on generation to generations as real estate. Talk about real property. The person's seat in the synagogue is, is certainly the, the uh, immobilier. But how much they... I do have one comment from letter from 1619 that we wanted to have the breed in the Alt Neuschel, but the Alt Neuschel was being used for the elections for the um, for the for the Gila, for the officers, and so they had to have the circumcision in a different synagogue. There seems to be some uh, because of Prague and being a big city. There seems to be a little bit more porousness about it. Um, but I, I, it's a good question. There are a lot of related issues yes. of, of, of people who moved after they've donated silver and then they want it to back. the synagogue and they want them back. And, and they want it back. Or that, that, that's the other, sort of related to that, that's the other point. In, in the case of uh, uh, Pisa, where I've worked through the entire first Pinkas, mm -hmm. and we're talking about from 1596 mm -hmm. to about 1640, right? We're talking about earlier than, than most of your material. Right. Um, and there, it's very clear that uh, the synagogue although they raise money originally from everybody to uh, uh, refurbish the building and, and so forth and so on, but the big donation comes from a couple that doesn't have children. And uh, in, in other words, the, the issue of uh, childlessness and memorialization is concretized in the Pinkas. They want to be remembered. They want their names recited at certain times. 
the, the rules are very explicit. These are all notarized wills in which all the rules about whether and how things will be done will be preserved. The community then each year has a complete inventory of all the precious objects which have to be recorded each year, each time there's a new election of new people who now become responsible for the stuff. And, and they literally write out the names with everybody in it. And it only disappears, I suspect, uh, uh, by the time you get, simply because after a while there's too much of this. In other words, you know, I, I think the major thing, thing that's happened, first of all, in other words, it happens, I think, earlier, at least in, in, in my little community. But also, I, I think what you're seeing by 1801, as I, I like the suggestion of, uh, 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 you know, uh, decorum and so forth very much. I like the idea that objects are not quite so important, but I think simply the volume of everything has simply become overwhelming. Uh, I mean, it's, it's simply you're reading a list, endless list that people just, it, it doesn't mean anything to anybody. Well, there is. That. I mean, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the synagogue's collector. We talked about collections, and you have this issue of do the object really belong to the synagogue, or are they sort of this permanent lease? And that's not always um, right. It's, it's, all, it's, it's very unclear. And there are a few lists from Prague. There's one from the Pinkus synagogue about 1601. There may have been a new building. There's one um, from the confiscation of the objects of the Meisel synagogue in a, in a legal dispute. We don't have these kinds of yearly lists. We have some yearly of objects in that same way, but there are sort of other anecdotal things about the importance. I, I just, uh, about the question of names in the synagogue, I mean, I just want to point out that all of the indentured synagogues from Palestine, there are names of the donors and uh, that may be remembered for good memory and so on, in Aramaic, in Hebrew, in Greek, we have in all languages, and then about the, the parochet is indicating a individual, there is this famous tshuva, from Padua, from the early 16th century, of the Maram. I mean, that there is there a German Jew coming to Padua, and he wants his coat of arms. The Tzvi Hirsch, Hirsch, what's his name? His name? It was a, it was a Hirsch, deer. He, want, a it was deer. A deer. he wanted, wanted it to be on the parochet. Right, that's so this Creed. is a similar thing from Crete. Yeah, I, no, in the Creed they replied to him, but he is. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to get on the wrong plane one day because I always do that. But also, this yeah. is also so very, very key in the Christian necrologies. The idea that one of the important things to mention is the is the founder of the community and from the founder of the community and then besides the Christian necrology you're talking about all Europe over a huge span of time so I'm ma making a, a you know, very rough generalization but, but one of the important elements is the founder of a community, the founder of a monastery, the founder of so and forth and then you become as if you were like a founder by donating some part, by making some donation, then you sort of turn yourself into helping to found the thing. I actually think, and I haven't done enough on it that I wouldn't publish or anything, but we always talk about all these memorials beginning from the First Crusades, uh, from Tadnu and from the response to the Rhineland massacres and so forth. I actually think that, that um, the, res the martyrologies from there, that there, I actually think that there may be some beginnings separate track. I'm not sure that all of these has corrupt that have to do with giving donations, giving objects, giving money, giving charity, and by the, for that you're remembered. I'm not sure that that develops entirely as a result of types of memorials that grow out of the massacres. I actually think there may be a parallel development where it's not exactly the same thing, and, and it's a long discussion about the number of uh, member books and so forth, but, but this element of donation, of foundation, and for that you would be remembered, and that you, you uh, if you can't actually found the entire institution, you approximate that by giving something substantial to it. That is, that's widespread in, in, um, in all the European and in the Christian ones also. <laughs> that's uh, well, one of the major contextual changes that happened, and as you mentioned, was the whitewashing of, of, of the synagogue. Uh -huh. I mean, what, what I think we have here is a, a, a presentation by the rabbis to say that uh, this previous tradition of, of decorating the synagogue as elaborately as uh, uh, the parochet um, is, is literally wiped off the walls, uh, except for the name of God. It's, right, it, well, the whitewashing... Well, I mean, I, I would really emphasize that. I, mean, I, that, that, I didn't give the historical the background, I didn't give the historical background for the whitewashing in 1618, which is the, the, the iconoclasm of the Calvinists who come and overthrow the Habsburgs in Prague in that period, and, and I have no idea how much that's related well, 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 to the Jews. But with the next 150 <laughs> years, um, it, it, it's common. It, uh, there's a response over and okay. over again. Yes, you okay, that's take the stuff off. And, and so maybe it, it's preserved in some areas and not others. Very big. Yeah,